Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at intraoperative bronchospasm. We're going to take a look at the pathophysiology, those patients at highest risk as well as triggers, signs and symptoms and how to identify it, and the treatment. So let's go ahead and get started. Now make no, make no mistake about this, intraoperative bronchospasm is a potentially life-threatening complication that must be recognized early and appropriately treated. So first, let's take a look at the pathophysiology. If we can understand this, then everything else falls into line. So imagine that this is our main stem bronchus and our left and right main stem bronchus. And there is a muscular layer that goes all the way around all of our bronchi. So we'll call that uh, bronchi. And the red is our muscle layer. So what happens is due to one reason or another, there is constriction of this muscular layer around the bronchioles, which results in originally your airway lumen being like this. It all gets constricted and squished in, resulting in an airway that is now this size. So why does this matter? Well, it increases our resistance, and resistance is equal to the resistivity constant times length of the tubing over A, our cross-sectional area. So as our cross-sectional area goes down, which happens in this case as the bronchioles become constricted, our resistance goes up. The greater the resistance, the harder it is to get air into our lungs. So what this translates to in clinically is that when you attempt to ventilate this patient, we'll say we'll try to give him a 500 tidal volume, your peak pressures are going to go way up as opposed to when the airways were bronchodilated because now you're trying to force the same amount of tidal volume in the same amount of time into a narrower lumen tube. Peak pressures increase dramatically. This can result in many problems, which we're going to talk about, including inability to oxygenate, ventilate, and remove CO2. Uh, we can also get increased mucus production and inflammation as a result of this kind of pathophysiology. So in the OR, this is most commonly seen in our COPD patients, our asthma patients, our smokers, and our patients with a history of reactive airways. Triggers, placing the ET tube, or just having it in place sometimes, and desflurane, specifically amongst our volatile anesthetics. Volatiles in general are irritating, with desflurane being the worst of them, are both triggers for a reactive airway. Now, while these may be the triggering events and they may be the patients who are at most high risk, it is unbelievably important that we remember that this can happen to anyone. So don't sleep on this condition, no pun intended. So what kind of signs and symptoms will we see if we suspect bronchospasm in our patients in the operating room? Well, since we should all be listening to our patient's lungs after the ET tube is in, we may see wheezing. And this will be bilateral. And we're going to have decrease in our breath sounds. And this is a function of the way air moves through a compressed airway. It makes higher pitch noises, just like turbulent blood flow through a vessel or valve. And the decreased breath sounds is because when you've narrowed the lumen of the tubing, you're going to get less air in. Now on our monitor, we will see a rise in our peak pressure increase peak pressure. Again, because we're trying to force the same amount of air in the same amount of time through a smaller, more narrow lumen of the bronchial tree. We will see an increase in our end tidal CO2 because this is an obstructive pathology, so it's hard for us to get CO2 out, so eventually it will rise in our blood, so it'll also increase our PA CO2 or arterial CO2. Now with that we're also going to see a gradual upslope of our CO2 
and title curve. And it's going to look something like this. And that's because in this obstructive pattern, you get less air out in the same amount of time and the CO2 that's in the blood gradually leaks out as opposed to a normal breath where everything meets its top concentration all at the same time. In this, you have more of CO2 slowly getting higher and higher. And then finally, if we were, say, using pressure control mode, you would have decreased volumes because now you're only using some amount of pressure and not a predetermined volume. And because it's going to take more pressure to deliver more volume in this case because of the reduced airway lumen, it means your volumes are going to go down as a result. So now really the money question, what are we going to do about it? So most of our intraoperative emergencies will start the same way. If we're going to alert the surgeon as to what we suspect is going on, we're going to call for help because an extra pair of hands in an emergency situation is always important. Next, we're going to set our patient to 100% oxygen. Now this is important because we want to denitrogenate them as best we can and ensure that any and all air that goes in to them is oxygen. This will saturate the reserve volume with oxygen. So if we get to a point where ventilation is almost impossible or our tidal volumes are extremely low, we will still have some reserved oxygen that our patient can sustain themselves on until we can resolve the issue and oxygenate and ventilate them again. Next, we want to deepen our anesthetic. And this is going to be with either propofol or sevoflurane. So we're going to go ahead and turn our sevoflurane up and we use propofol especially because it's a good bronchodilator uh, in order to help open the airway. Now we can also use ketamine usually dosed at 0.2 to 1 milligram per kilogram and this may also work. Now you can turn your volatile up, like I said, but remember, we're having a hard time getting air into this patient because of the narrowed lumen. As a result, it's going to be difficult to deepen the patient's anesthetic with volatiles because it simply won't get the same volume in that we need. So IV tends to work better. Next, we want to administer some short-acting bronchodilators. So these are things like our albuterol. And we can do this by disconnecting our endotracheal tube from the circuit and directly puffing albuterol via an inhaler directly into the tube. This will help to improve the bronchoconstriction via the beta agonism effects. Now, if the bronchospasm persists, this is when we start to look at our more heavy hitters. In this case, we can use epi, IV, 10 to 100 micrograms per kil oh, just micrograms, I'm sorry, 10 to 100 mics at a time. But in this case, we always need to be vigilant of our patient's blood pressure and our heart rate. Epinephrine, as we know, works as a beta-2 agonist, which will help to dilate the bronchi by relaxing the muscles around the bronchi. Uh, we can also use racemic epi, which we would nebulize via the ventilator itself. So we'll just put racemic epi as a separate, and this epi is gonna get right into the airways and diffuse to the muscles right there at the site of action. We also want to use steroids, usually hydrocortisone, 100 milligrams. And as we know, steroids can help with swelling and inflammation that are a result of the bronchospasm. Now, finally, by the end, if the, the bronchospasm should have resolved, but if not, the last step, and you know, hopefully the, the last thing you ever have to do is ECMO. So our extracorporeal membranous oxygenator in order to oxygenate this person while you figure out how to resolve the bronchospasm. Now, once resolved, we should always get an ABG to make sure that our patient's metabol metabolic derangements are dealt with after. And they can vary depending on how long this goes on for. So that's all for intraoperative bronchospasm. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact us. If you're interested in getting involved, Feel free to send us a message, hit the like button below, subscribe, follow us on Instagram at Count Backwards from 10, and stay tuned for the next video.